Took a breather and came back in no time yep. Put the ball in my possession and it's showtime I'm taking the last shot, coach, don't mind nah. I'm a different predicament, so it troubles you Game clock ticking and I'm coming for the W One man ain't enough, they gon' have to double two Get ball shot made, all the fans loving you Time expired, everybody rushing you yep. Now you done showed them what you about Try to tell you we was gon' make it without a doubt do what they can, I'm already stamped And I be shitting like Kevin Durant Kevin Durant, in the game, made up When I steps on the floor, I don't waste time Two seconds, one shot, I'ma make mine Get a three-pointer on baseline They want my spot, I'm trying to save mine So you should move over 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 How's everybody doing, man? Hoop Near the Podcast. I'm here with my boy OT, and uh, we got a special guest in the building today. Yes, sir, man. We took it back again with the we got the uh, we got the old school legend from Seattle in the building, man. Yeah, man. We got a Seattle native, man. OG uh, graduated from Mercer Island High School. Travis Decor, the current head coach of the University of Montana Grizzlies, uh, 2018 Coach of the Year two-time Big Sky tournament champs, you know, three-time Big Sky regular season champs, just to, you know, name off a couple of accolades, Coach. That's just what we do, man. We got to show our respect, man. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, y'all. Oh, man, of course. I mean, you know, you're an OG. Uh, you know, Fred said and was telling me about, uh, you know, back at Mercer Island. What what, what was the – what was the uh, basketball world? What, what was the competition like back back then in, in, in Seattle? We no. was just, I think we was just born, huh, bro? Yeah, <laughs> we're young pups. You know, when you when you you go back to like the mid '80s, um, really to now, a lot really hasn't changed in terms of when you really look at the championships because it was three A. We didn't have four A back then. Mm. The Metro and the Kinko were were the C King district, mm. and the state championship came from that district. I want to say it was like nine out of 10 years, oh, but it was, okay. it was a long run where if you won that district, you probably were the favorite to win state. Um, and then, and then it, it, it kind of snuck in where the 2A was growing and O'Day started making their runs. Um, and, then, and then when I left and went to college was about when the split went to 4A. Mm. Uh, and then the Kinko split in half, went to 4A. Metro split in half, went to 4A. And then that's when you started seeing the run that you see now with 3A, 4A really coming from two regions for the most part. Every once in a while, you know, an Eastern Washington team would stick in from time to time. Yep, yep. More of lately. Um, but back then, the run really came from one district. Yeah, they, uh, you know, a lot of my, you know, a lot of my OGs and, you know, a lot of the guys that I talked to told me you had put in a lot of work, Trav. One thing I wanted to ask you was, um, was there anything, you know, was there anything big or important for you going, you know, being a Seattle guy, going to Mercer Island? Like, what was that like for you? Culture shock. Yeah. You know, and, and for me, you know, in, in, in our era, um, you know, I graduated in 89. Right, so, right. <laughs> you know, the, the 80s, early 90s, we, we didn't really have AAU back then. We didn't have summer teams. So we played for our, our community centers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, every Saturday you were looking forward to <laughs> Rainier versus Rainier Beach, okay. Van Asphalt versus Rainier Beach, Hutchison, you know, and then we sneak up to the CD and go play Miller. Yeah. Um, and, and so everybody was playing for their neighborhood. And so there was a lot to represent growing up. And, and fortunately for me, Rainier Beach had a really solid run at Rainier Beach Community Center from first through eighth grade the city champion came from Rainier Beach in my, at least in my age group. Um, and, and, you know, so if you class of 88, 89 or 90, everything went through Rainier Beach. Mm -hmm. And so for me to go to Mercer Island was tough because we had three teams, Metcalf, Dekir, and Alcatara. Mm -hmm. And when we split, everybody really all went to Metro schools except me. Mm -hmm. Self, Rainier Beach, Franklin, Garfield. That's pretty much where everybody went. Right. Um, and I, I wasn't at either one. So I was the one guy off the three teams that wasn't playing. Uh, and, and Odette. Mm. Um, and so, you know, every every weekend there was, you know, you had to come back and, and, and prove <laughs> you were the same guy, even though they didn't see you all week. 
<laughs> um, but it was healthy for me because I, I didn't know my dad was preparing me for later in my life. And when I, when I went to you know college, there wasn't going to be any playing for black coach, all black team. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone at some point in time. And for me, I did it at 15, um, where a lot of people just didn't do it until they left school. I think that's real big, you know, being, a, you know, an inner city kid and, you know, being around, just like you said, African-Americans, your kind, pretty much majority of your life. It's not like that in the real world. And uh, I know Fred uh, started to see that world a little bit when I went to O'Day. Yeah. And then I know, Fred, you started to see it when you went to Seattle U, right? Yeah. Yeah. Be going to being at a, you know, metro school and then going to a, a private Catholic school like that. It was definitely eye opening, most definitely. You know, that's big. And so you went to Chaminade, right? Well, well high school. Um, you know, I, I, I went there my freshman year there. Yep. I was excited about their schedule. You know, they, they, they were known for their tournaments, their holiday tournaments. So the yeah. Maori Classic still. Yeah. But they had a Christmas tournament and a New, Year, and a New Year's tournament. So as a D2 school, you were going to play 10 D1s a year. Yeah, mm-hmm. just in the tournaments alone, and then you get some teams coming through on their way to something else. Someone might play Hawaii and then slide over and play us before or after. We'd sneak in some extra games. And as a freshman, we were independent because they were in the, in the process of trying to transition into Division One. At least that's how they recruited me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so at the time, they they had been in the same league as you know Seattle Pacific, Western. Uh, Metro State, schools like mm-hmm. that. And, and so they still kept some of those schools on their schedule, high-end D2 schedule, and then played D1s. And so I was just attracted to the competition. Mm. I, I had something I wanted to prove that, you know, I was a Division One player. Um, and, and, you know, it was an, op- an opportunity. So you, you ended up being the team MVP, correct, on that team? Yes. And then you uh, you took your talents. You you were able to show that you were a Division One player and took your talents to University of Montana. What was uh, what was that process like? Was there a was there any like a riff with the coach or anything, or was there kind of like everybody kind of knew? No, it, it was authentic. The coach was yeah. let go actually. Okay. Uh, so he was an assistant the year prior to me getting there. Okay. The head coach that had it, it had had the long run with Shaman not retired. Mm-hmm. They gave him the job. And so after one year, they let him go. Um, and for me, you know, they opened, started the process of interviewing coaches. It was the only losing season I ever had in my life. Like I said, I, you know, I'm a Rainier Beach kid, and then I go to Mercer Island. Yeah. I've never lost. I've always been on teams that competed for championships if we didn't win them. Um, and, and to lose 20 games, we're 8-20. and 20. Mm. That just didn't settle well in my stomach. And, and I just didn't see where we were going to get that turned around because – it's all about the culture. And, and I was on a team with guys that had transferred down from Division ones, guys that had gotten out of the service. They were all there for their individual reasons, but none of them had to do with winning. Yeah. And it wasn't an environment that was conducive to what I was trying to do or what I was used to. So it was just time for me to go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I got back in touch with my high school coach and he got in touch with some college coaches and I had some contacts and some things taking place. And back then, we had the, the summer league, the NC2A summer league at Bellevue Community College. Mm. And that's where everybody, D1 all the way down to yeah. D2, even the junior college guys play. And so a lot of coaches would come through and recruit from that. Um, and Ed Peppel at the time had been in, in contact with a few coaches or whatnot. He just happened to be in Vegas at one of the events with his yeah. B5 team, ran into a guy by the name of Blaine Taylor, and, you know, Blaine said, hey, I'm looking for a point guard, et cetera, et cetera. He said, I got one, Travis DeCure. Mm. And he was like, I, I remember him. I seen him play. He played for his dad this summer, right? And he said, yes. He said, yeah, I, I just didn't see much. He said, well, they had like six point guards on that team. <laughs> he said, exactly. And, and, and you know, we, it was a hood team, man. It was a South Bend team. So <laughs> Marcus Lawley went to Stanford. Uh, Marcus Stubblefields went to Queens College out of self. I mean, it was a, field, a loaded yeah. team. Um, guy by the name of Derek Fields was on that team. That was he was the leading scorer for Inner Beach. We had one state with Doug Creasy that year. It was just a loaded deck. Yeah. And so my job was just get get everybody else the ball. You're not going to stand out in an AAU event. 
<laughs> and so he came to the, to the summer league and watched me play. And about two days later, offered me a scholarship. I went out on a visit. And I had been talking to some other schools, but they were about winning. Yeah. And that's all I was looking for. And uh, it worked out. So for me, it was maintaining a relationship with my high school coach. Mm -hmm. um, and then having some decent numbers and some D1 games and having a decent resume and taking care of business. Now you're, you're at your alma mater as a head coach. Uh, when, you know, we, we, we both know people who are either, you know, Fred's uh, in the coaching right now. We know some people are in the coaching on different levels. When does a player know that he wants to be a coach after he's done playing? That's a good question. And, and I'm going to try to make the long answer as short as possible. <laughs> everyone it's authentic man it, it 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 happens differently for everyone there's a lot of guys that know they want to do it yeah. but making it happen sometimes isn't always in in their control mm -hmm. for me I, I didn't know I wanted to coach you know I was a business major I, I thought I was going to go home and start my own company I had no idea what that was going to be what it looked like how to do it but that was in my plan somehow and in the summers I'd come back my dad was still coaching and so I came home and one summer he had a team and he had to work and he's like, I need you to coach him for the, for the uh, AAU qualifier and then I'll take him to nationals. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a tournament at Rainier Beach. And so it was a bunch of guys that were like two, three years younger than me, class of like 91, 92 coming out. And it was a loaded team. And so we won the tournament. That was my first coaching experience. And then I came back the next summer after I graduated and didn't have a job. And Ed Pepple called and said, hey, I need you to work my camp, pay good money. So I did that. And I didn't realize he had a freshman job open. And, and that really was why he was asking me to work camp. He was interviewing me. He was watching me. Right. And, you know, so I thought about it. And I didn't do it. And then the next year, I thought, you know what? I kind of like coaching. So I tried to get in in the Metro. Mm. And I won't mention any names. Yeah. But there was two Metro coaches that I went to and couldn't get, couldn't get the freshman job, couldn't get the JV job. Then I applied for the job at Washington, the eighth grade girls job. My sister was there. Okay. Didn't get the job. Wow. So I went back to Marshall Island, took the freshman job the next year, and then it all just kind of working out, started working out for me there. A lot of, a lot of them schools are shaking I, them heads right now. Yeah, I know that. It's, it's, it's crazy because that's kind of how I started too coaching. The, uh, I coached with uh, Kefri Fazio before he went on to SPU. I coached with him at West Seattle, but I started on a C team, you know, and it's, it's, it's crazy, like, just hearing that story because sometimes to me I'd be thinking everybody um, doesn't start there. You know, I'm like, some man, guys aren't starting here, you know, but hearing, hearing you say that and you're well-respected and, and uh, what you do and as far as wins and everything that you do, that just lets me know that, you know, it don't matter where you really start at, you know, because I had talks with some of my guys that told me, oh, maybe you should start lower or your or, or C team. Like, what are you going to get out of that? You know, I heard a lot of those talks. You can't start any lower than I started. Yeah. And, and I, I think the reality is it's who you work with. Yeah. And, and, and if you get a chance to work with people that know what they're doing, to do it the right way mm -hmm. and have success, then things can happen. But it, it, it was a slow grind for me. I, you know, freshman job, two years later, I got the JV job. I started my own AAU team, mm -hmm. ninth graders. That was the fast break, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yep. okay. And and just kind of was doing my own thing and ended up getting an opportunity at Sammamish. Yep, I seen that. Here before, I applied for the Ballard job and couldn't get that. Applied for the FOSS job, couldn't get that. So, so Sammamish comes around and hey, you know, it's an opportunity. Do you think, um, it, but for you, wasn't one of those like, nobody kind of in this inner city's rocking with me, so let me kind of just go over here and make my own wave? Right. Okay. Right. And, okay. and no, I mean, those jobs are hard to get. There's, there's yeah. politics to some of it, you know, yeah. the better sure. jobs are always hard to get at every level. That just is what it is. Can people hire who they know? Um, and, and so I just stayed over there on the east side because they were familiar with me. They knew mm -hmm. me. 
um, and Pebble could help me get into some doors. Mm-hmm. And it just worked out. And, and so after a couple of years of that, I did, you know, Green River worked out. And then that was. How did you coach my guy Goof at Green River, man? That was my first chance. I know? talked to him today, man. He spoke so highly of you, man. Now, Goof took over the program shortly yeah. after I left, you know. Yeah. And, and um, that, that, I grew up with that, with those guys. You know, I, I grew from a high school coach that yeah. was trying to, you know, save a couple lives, get a couple people off the block to actually coach X and O, run a program, mm-hmm. be responsible for people's futures, um, and think into the future. I, I learned all that. I developed into that at Green River, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I was fortunate to have some talent um, that was going through some adversity. And, and so we all kind of grew up together. And that, 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 that might have been the funnest ride I've ever been on those two years at Green River. For, for you, what, what, is the, what is the best aspect of coaching? Mm. Good question, bro. Results. Mm. Results. Um, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it always comes down to guys you work with and, and, and what they look like four or five years later and what your conversation is with them later. Because it's, 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 it's often, man, that I'm going to tell a guy, you know, you're not going to be happy with me while you're here. Yeah. It's going to be hard because there's growth that you need you, you, you need to be a part of, whether that's your own individual growth or the growth of the group that you're with. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of responsibilities that you're not mature enough to assume. But you got to take it and you got to and you got to fight through it. And, and, and if you survive it, you've arrived as a man. And, and so that process is what I always look forward to. And I've had some guys leave mad, but they, for some reason, are the ones I'm the closest with now. Yeah. Um, and, and so to see a guy like Ryan Blassen game coach junior college ball yeah. and, and raise young men the way he's raising them, mm-hmm. I enjoy that more than I did the time I coached him. Yeah. And I'm not taking full responsibility for it. He was surrounded with some good people. That's real. Saying, those are the things that, to me, this is supposed to be about it. And so now when you got a young man graduate from college for your school, and he might be the first in his family to get a diploma. Mm-hmm. He's starting a new trend in his own family. And you were a part of that, whether you had a big part or a small role in it. Mm-hmm. Just to me, that that's what I enjoy. That's what I like to come back at and watching guys move on and have some success. Um, whether that's in their own individual life or some of them become coaches. Yeah. Now you're at, uh, uh, you're, like I said before, you're all alma mater, uh, Montana, and you're doing a hell of a job there, uh, turning that program around. Uh, Fred's named some of the accolades. And, you know, kind of just like you said about, you know, you have no problem taking uh, the smaller school and, you know, uh, working your way. What, what, what is behind the success at University of Montana and with you being the head coach there? Uh, I mean, in all honesty, Montana's built to win. Mm. You know, when when I was there, in the big sky was us, Boise, Nevada, Weber State, Montana State, pretty much everything ran through those four schools. Yeah. And we, we had the budget, we had the resources, we had the fans. Um, and, and so it was always set up to be successful. And they hadn't won for a long time. They had a good run with Judd Heathcote, uh, Brandenburg, um, all the way down to Mike Montgomery. Mike Montgomery, right? Mm-hmm. And Stu Moore was winning, but, but they had had like 17 years. They hadn't won a championship. And they kind of tweaked their recruiting a little bit. You know, they went into San Francisco. They went down to Louisiana. They went into Milwaukee. They came to Seattle. Mm-hmm. And, and they got a batch of guys that were a little different than what they had in the past. And so from that point forward, they won, right? And, and if you look at the history of Montana, you take my run out of it. On the West Coast, outside of a Pac-12 school, Gonzaga's the only team that's been to the NCAA tournament more than Montana. Yeah. So it's built to win, right? And you got two Hall of Fame coaches that have been there, Judd Heathcote and Mike Montgomery. You got a guy by the name of Blaine Taylor that recruited me. He's got the highest win percentage of, of, of everyone. Stu Moore, who I signed to play for there, he left, went to Colorado State and then Utah State. 
He's got the most wins of everyone. Wayne Tinkle's at Oregon State, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Larry Kostoviak, Wayne Tinkle, like me, played there and then coached. And Larry is one of two coaches to win an NCAA tournament game. And Wayne's the all-time winning coach. So when I get the job to replace Wayne, I got big shoes to fill because all these guys have done all these things. Yeah. And, and, and under normal circumstances, you don't take that job. Yeah. Because there's, what can you do? Right? And, and so for me, I had to kind of pinpoint some things that I could do different than what everyone else did. The, the, a lot of the things we do, what we're about, how we run the program and all that, the same. Right? You learn all that through the programs that you're with. I worked for Blaine and I worked for Mike Montgomery. So the things that they were good at, the things that they were successful with, I'd take all that. And then you put your own personality on it. For me, it was like, maybe, maybe I can put more talent on the floor. Yeah. Right? And, right. and instead of being worried about winning as many championships, getting to the tournament as much, because that's a pressure cooker. And, yeah. and if you can't get that to happen overnight. It's a long wait for the next March. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, so you got to control what you control in the daily. So for me, it was recruiting and development and relationships. And, and so our blueprint since I got together, I got a good staff is, you know, we've got the fourth, fifth and sixth all time leading scorers mm -hmm. in the history of the school. And one of them only played three seasons in my world. Yeah. Tacoma. So, Tacoma boy, yep. so we, we put some talent on the floor that they hadn't really seen and we had them all together. Um, and then we've been able to fundraise and do some things with the community mm -hmm. and take it to another level in terms of how we go about our day, how we travel, how we take care of our guys. You know, I've been able to pay for three former players, masters, bring them back, pay for their masters. It's big time. We charter four or five times a year. Yeah. Um, you know, I see you guys got an award for academics too, man. I know I, I see you real big on that. Got a lot of guys, 100% graduation rate of seniors. Yeah, yeah that's, that's big too. Big. That's extremely big. We've been successful in all, on all three avenues, right? The social life, academics, and, and obviously on the court. And then some guys got to grow up and some mistakes yeah. that you made and how you handle those also are, are, are a sign of who you are and what you're about. And, we try to do right by everybody, but you can't always make sure everybody's happy because you got so many guys in the program. They all don't get what they want. Yeah. But they all get what they earn. No, that's extremely big. That's big. Coach Trav, you talked about some things that's extremely important. Um, if briefly, if you could, could you talk about your, uh, your time at Old Dominion as an assistant and uh, what you learned there and how it shaped you for um, your career? moving forward so after my first year at green river yeah um, larry kostoviak was an assistant of dominion he left mm. um they had larry kostoviak and kenny gaddis and two former nba players as, as assistant coaches there and so my old coach he had seen me coaching the green river team down at a, ju at a junior college event in oklahoma mm. and he saw trey going off <laughs> yeah i heard he was kidding right. <laughs> trey jamal miller and uh and, and Mike, oh, yeah, you had a squad. You had Jamal too. Oh, yeah. Mike Thompson and 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 you know those three guys put up numbers <laughs> and they had size. Yeah, at a high level, you know Jamal athleticism and speed, and and so they were attractive to a lot of college coaches off the bat. You know, Robert Bishop was my machine though. He 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 was my heart and soul. He had played for me mm -hmm. at Sammamish. Um, he knew how I operated. He knew what we needed. He really was just as responsible for their success okay. as I would have been. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were down there and putting up numbers. We averaged 103 a game in the NWAC. We were scoring in the 90s down there. And at the time, Trey was committed to South Alabama. Mm -hmm. And and I so my coach, Blaine Taylor, had, was there. I didn't even know. I hadn't talked to him in 10 years. And he was watching my team play, and he liked some of my guys. So he called me recruiting my guys, asking yeah. about my guys. And he really liked Trey. And at the time, I was like, well, you know, he doesn't play for me anymore. He's at Odessa. He just showed up to the tournament. So I let him play with us. And that kind of started the conversation with Old Dominion. So he had a job open. He was like, you know, I saw what you were doing with your team. I kind of need that. Would you be interested in coaching Division One? I? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave this group. 
And he said, why? I said, well, I got four kids that transfer here to play for me. That's real. And I can't leave when they're sitting on one year of junior college and they just got here a couple mm -hmm. months ago. So he said, I get it, you know, and, and so I didn't do that. I stayed and, and we had a good run. And in the meantime, Trey came. And so we had a good run. And it just so happened the next year, Kenny Gaddison went back to the NBA. So he called me again and then I went. And he hired me to be in charge of academics. And, you know, it's the typical role for a guy in my situation. You got the academics, keep them out of trouble. And when they get in trouble, you handle the discipline. And, and then everybody else would kind of, you know, do the X and O and then recruit. And so I took it when I got there. And then over my five years, I evolved. Mm -hmm. And because I played for Blaine, I could have those closed door conversations with what I wanted and what my growth, what was important to me for my growth. And he gave me all those things. And in the meantime, he sent me down the hall, you know, go talk to the AD about the money, the money for summer school. Mm -hmm talk to the AD about the money for these buy games. Um, and so I got used to talking to administrators. And little did I know by my fifth year, I was ready. I was ready. I knew how to do a schedule. I knew how to, to manage academics. I knew how to manage travel. He gave me the game. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so then he was supposed to take some jobs. He had a couple jobs pop. And he didn't take him. He kind of outpriced himself a little bit. And at the end of the day, he didn't want to leave. He had a good job. He had the best job in the league. He was living life well. His family liked Virginia. Um, and so I put the pressure on him. And just like, Coach, I, I can't retire from here. And so he said, my guy's going to be back in the game in another year or two, and I'll take care of you. And at the time, we thought Mike Montgomery would get Indiana. And that didn't happen. And, and then at the Final Four, he got the cow job. And Blaine set me up with the interview 24 hours after Mike was announced as a head coach. 48 hours after that, I was offered the job and then migrated back to the West Coast in Berkeley, California. Hey, OT, all I know is I always remember watching those uh, Jerome Randles and Patrick Christopher and Gutierrez. Like, those a lot teams, of players guys, came out of Cal, bro, in that yeah, time frame. Man, our, those teams, man, you guys had some dudes, man. What was the big dude name that got drafted to the Celtics? Leon Pope, what was his name? Leon Pope. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, Leon. So Leon had left right before I got there. Okay. He was a monster, though. And yeah. If Leon had injuries. If, if Leon didn't have injuries, he you know, he'd play for a long time. He had bad yeah. feet. But he got him an NBA championship. Exactly. You know, and, and we were fortunate at Cal because with it being an academic institution, you, you weren't going to get the guys that were going to Arizona. Right. UCLA, Duke, right? And, and we might steal one. We'd get one, you know, every once in a while. But mm -hmm. we had the guys with the chip on their shoulder that we might take them instead of going <laughs> to the Mountain West. Yeah. Right? We had three of those guys become the conference MVP. And, you know, and, and so that's where I learned, I mean, you're better off having the guy with a chip on his shoulder that's been told no than the guy that, that's been mm -hmm. catered to and thinks he's better than everybody. He might be better than everybody, but if he thinks he is, yeah. he might not overachieve. If he's trying to prove he's better than everybody but never been told, he's going to overachieve. Who, who is your favorite player you've coached at Cal? Man, I can't, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, hey, all the coaches, they, I, hey, I respect them because they all say, I can't, I can't, I, mean, I respect it. I'm man. just thinking all the players, uh, I'm like, man. Them guys, man, you get me in trouble. Man. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, you know, they all were special to me in a lot of different ways. And, and I, I'll draw some names of the guys that are just household names, right? Okay. Like, you know, you mentioned Jerome Randall. Well, Jerome Randall, he had some of that Isaiah Thomas in him. And, <laughs> and, 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 and some of the, uh, the best games I've ever been a part of, I kind of found myself just sitting back watching them two go at it. Mm. You're going to get 30, what well, I'm going to get 31. Right, right. You know, and they fouling each other, and they can't guard, neither one of them could guard each other. Right. And and they both in space, and and so that was fun. And and Jerome had that chip because he was five eight, and he you know, and he, he just felt disrespected, and he had something to prove every day. He became an all time leading scorer. Yeah. Patrick Christopher was second all time in scoring, and they were on the same team for four Man. years together. So That's crazy. Backboard is one and two all time in history for scoring in, 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 at a Pac-12 school. That's crazy. So that was a special situation. 
But we had a guy by the name of Theo Robertson that nobody talks about playing the three. He was the most skilled player on the team. He could play one through five, really. He could shoot. He could handle. He, he understood the scout. He understood who you were guarding and how. He was kind of your coach on the floor. And he, and, and he had the perfect mannerisms for those other two guys. Mm. So he fit perfectly. That's critical. And then Jorge is a freshman. You know, Jorge is from Mexico. Yeah. Jorge, Jorge transferred to a high school, Denver East, and won a state championship in Denver and was living in an apartment with six other kids from wow. Mexico. Damn. Poor. Mm. And, and so he had that grit. And, and he'd be that guy in practice every once in a while. He'd be like, coach, man, you, you going to let him get away with that? <laughs> guys were doing stuff the way they spoke. Hey, man, you going to let him get away with that? Like, Jorge, you got it. Go ahead. Yeah. And he'd go say something, you know. And he's the only player in history, player of the year, and defensive player. Yeah, I remember that. In the Pac-12, right? And, and there were some guys that felt robbed because, you know, he only averaged 14 a game. Yeah. But they all knew, man, when Impact. he was on the floor, mm -hmm. they didn't want to play against that dude. He was going to steal the ball. He was going to foul you. He wasn't going to never talk no trash, but he was going to be physical and use yeah. four of his five fouls every game. Um, and, and so those guys were together. That, that's that Pac-12 championship team. Yeah. You know, with guys like Alan Crabb, Justin Cobbs. Alan, oh, um, man, I remember Jay Cobbs, Curry, man. Jordan Matthews, Tyrell Wallace. Yeah. T. Wallace, that was the lefty, huh? <laughs> those, those, those Southern Cal kids, they brought it every day, you know. Um, but, you know, we, we had some guys, man, the David Kravishes of the world that nobody talks about, the long, lanky block shots, yeah. mid-range jumpers. Harper Camp was, you know, student athlete of the year that was physical and could guard any post. We had some guys, man, but, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it was guys that were not told they were NBA players and were trying to prove that they could play for money. And they wanted to win. And, and so we were fortunate. We had a good run there in six years. Yeah, and I listen to Hoop Meredith podcast. Uh, we got uh, Montana coach Travis DeCure in the building, man, giving us his Hoop Narrative. Uh, we got a real a quick ad real quick, and then we're going to come right back to y'all. What's up, yeah? And y'all now back with Hoop Narrative Podcast. So we got Montana coach Travis DeCure in the building, Seattle native. Uh, we're rapping about the uh, University of Montana. And uh, actually, we just got off talking about uh, his tenure at Cal. Uh, coach, uh, what was uh, what was the process like uh, when you did? Did you you try to get the Cal, uh, Cal job when it became available? Listen, man, I was I was I was pissed when you didn't get it. I ain't gonna lie, man. But I, that that's just my two cents, man. I was pissed when Mike and they didn't give it to, to a guy that's been there right next to the guy knows everything, you know, the day to day. And it just kind of went a different, you know, a different way. And I get the politics, but I feel you deserve that. Yeah. There, there's a lot of things that play into it, you know, yeah. and he did me a solid when he went on national TV and said that I deserve to be mm. head coach at Cal. And, and, yep. and I remember and that back to a coach because he added to the perception of me as a coach. Yeah. There might have been people that were like, oh, you know, Travis probably getting something done. He might be okay. So, no, he must he must know what he's doing if that Hall of Fame coach said he's legit. And, mm -hmm. and so that opened some doors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and at, at the end of the day, for me, I've been told no every time first. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it wasn't nothing – it wasn't new to me to – be in a situation, hoping it happens, looking forward to the opportunity, knowing I've got the relationship with the guys, we're ready to go, we return almost the whole team. Um, excited, but also knowing, you know, life's never been that easy for me, man. Like, yeah. you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm at, I, I, I win a national championship with the group, with the core group from Foss. Yeah. When the ninth grade slamming jam, the job comes open, and all the parents wrote letters of recommendation. I sit in an interview and I, I can't even get a second interview. Yeah. So, I, it, it, you know, when I got the, the, the Green River job, they actually gave it to someone else. Wow. Wow. And then that guy wanted a full-time job. They couldn't make it happen. So then they called me back. So humility, you, you, you got to be okay with being told no and accept 
Yeah. But there's a reason why the opportunity wasn't given to you, even though you feel like you earned it and make the most of the next thing. So for me, when, when that happened, you know, I hit the ground running. Yeah. I, was phone, I was on the phone the night before the decision with Lorenzo Romar trying to go to the dub. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, 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 I'm begging, coach. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, I'll be the ops. I'll be the, like, I don't even need to be on the floor. You know? And, and then I was talking to Ernie Kent, Washington mm -hmm. State, Oregon had a job. So I was on the verge of an assistant job. Somewhere. Right. And, and then Oregon State popped. And, you know, I, I'll tell a little bit about this process. So Oregon State pops, AD calls, he comes down to talk, and, and I knew, you know, Wayne Tink was involved, you know, Dame Stoudemire, there's some names. So I'm like, yeah. I, I probably can't get it, but I'm going to go full board. So I got to do something different. So I went into recruiting mode. Mm. And at this time, Seattle's hot. Yeah. Portland's hot. So there's 15 kids, high major, from 12th grade down to eighth grade, right? So I'm, I, I got to make a statement. So I go into the interview, and it's a phone interview, right? Yeah. So I'm on the phone, and, and I'm in the airport, and we're talking, and whatever, whatever. And we get towards the end of it. And they, you know, they asked me if I had some questions. And I asked a couple questions just about some details or whatever. And they said, well, we appreciate your time and we'll get back to you. You know, we're going to do one more round. And I said, well, can I ask you for one more, one more favor before I get off the line? And they said, yes. I said, does everyone have a Twitter account? They said, yes. I said, look up the hashtag Northwest Express. Mm. And the room went silent. And then you can hear the mumbling. And then the AD goes, okay, we, we get your point. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we appreciate it. That, that, was, that was big, what you just did. You hung up. And then he called me back a couple of days later, kind of explained the process and whatever. But what had happened was I contacted all them kids. Yeah. And they all tweeted with the hashtag Northwest Express. Mm -hmm. Northwest Express was Oregon State the last time they had gone to the NC2A tournament and had a good team prior to the Gary Payton run and all that. So yeah. when Oregon State was good, they were they called they were, they gave them the nickname the Northwest Express. Okay. So that that group knew what I was talking about when I said that. And my okay. point was, if you give me this shot, I might not get all fifteen of these kids, but I'm gonna get some of them. Right. Um, and and it, it never came to fruition, and and so you just got to move on to the next thing. And and they hired Wayne Tinkle on Sunday. They did. I remember. Sunday night, I got a phone call from Ken Haslam at the University of Montana. On Tuesday, I was in Eastern Wa in, in Eastern Washington doing an interview, and two days later, I was a Grizz again. I guess I always was a Grizz, but I'm right, right, right. <laughs> oh, so, you know, things happen for a reason, and and I've been in a good situation. I've grown. Um, I'm a better coach today than I was back then. You know, at this level, what people don't understand is that you have to do more at a lower level than you do at a, at a higher level. Mm. At a higher level, you just got to get some talent, coach them, show up to make some appearances for some donors and have some energy and a few things. You know, there's some other things you got to do. But at a lower level, you got you, you, you really actually have to balance your budget. You got to raise the money for the budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you just, there's just way more time into your program than there is with just the players. Yeah. And, and so that's why you see so many guys at a lower level when they get an opportunity to do well, because the, the job's not easier. It's different. Yeah. You're doing less. Mm -hmm. And so now you can focus more on being the CEO in the basketball portion of it, as long as you hire a good staff and do it right. And so I was fortunate that I, you know, I don't know that I'd be where I'm at right now as a coach right. if I'd have got those other opportunities. How do you feel about the the state right now of African American coaches in, in Division One basketball? I I my answer is going to be more than basketball. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked this question when I left Cal, and they were kind of retooling some things with the administration, and, and I said. It, it, it's hard 
for success when we have so few black leaders. And, and so as coaches, it's an opportunity to be in a leadership role with people that are doing something they love to do. So you have their, you have their undivided attention, yeah. right? So that basketball is a tool to have a conversation and I'm always use that, right? Right. So when there's not very many of us coaching, when there's a low percentage of us coaching and you look at the numbers of success of the student athlete, they correlate. There's a lot of guys slipping through the cracks. There's a lot of guys that don't reach their full potential. There's a lot of guys that when they get to college, don't leave the guy we thought they were going to become. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with the person that's leading them. If that's they, real. If they can't relate to them, they can't lead them, right? If you mm. haven't been through what I've been through, if you haven't seen the world through my eyes, you can't help me with what I'm looking at. Facts, real. And, and so I'm not saying we only can be led by black men. Right. But when there's none or very few, it's very difficult to be successful. And fortunately for me, I had a father in my life that was really hands-on and so when I went to Mercer Island and then went to Montana, I still had him. And he helped me through the things that I was going through. But, you know, I won't, I, I won't use any examples because I, I, that wouldn't be right. It's not my business. But right. there's a lot of guys out there struggling. Yeah. That they just need the right person talking to them. Yeah. And but, and we talk about this all the time. All this we in our group chat is one of the, the things that we talk about we feel like African Americans should should get more opportunities. Um, we talk with a guy, Clint Parks, kind of about this. He always brings this up, but I want you to speak on the stigma of because you're a head coach, Trav, so you've made it to that level. But speak on the stigma of uh, if you're an African American coach at the level that you're at, or regardless, that the only way you'll probably be successful is having players. Is that a stigma, or is there some actual some actuality to that? I want you to to touch on that. Cause we hear that a lot, right? Oh, like if you don't uh, got players, we definitely you probably do. won't be successful at that level. Because that's how guys are getting jobs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and 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 for a long time, and you still see it when when, yeah. when there's only one black assistant on the staff. Yeah, yeah. Then it's obvious what his role is, right? And, and, yep. and it might not only be recruiting, but he's the relationship guy. Right. Good or bad relationship, right? And. And, 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 and so that's not fair. It's not fair to the athletes and it's not fair to that coach mm -hmm. because you're minimizing his potential yeah. and you're stunting their growth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what, what happens, right? There, there's a group that they used to call the Villa Seven. And the Villa Seven was a Nike deal and it basically brought in, it was a consortium for the top assistant coaches in the country. Men and women, right? And, and I think the numbers were like 25, 25 men, 25 women, something like that. And they bring in all these ADs, search firms, the whole nine, and, and you you get to know people, you, you they train you, you do you do inter mock interviews, the whole nine, right? right. And, and so this is conducive to becoming a head coach. Right. And there's a lot of black assistants in here. And every time I sat down with an AD, or a search firm guy, when it was my opportunity, the first question was, who'd you recruit to Cal? It's crazy. When you were in Montana, who'd you recruit? And I'd always go, you know what? I, I, I recruited some all-conference players, but my role's more than that. And so I'd go into my role and start defining, you know, I do this, I do this, I do this, I'm in charge of these things. And then they go, okay, yeah, sounds good. And, and, and they really didn't want to hear that sometime. And because I do think there's people that think that is our role. Okay. But that makes sense. Yeah. that's because that's the role that's been given. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, like I say, I'm fortunate because I work for someone I play for, so they know what's in my mind. Mm -hmm. I was his point guard, right? I won championships with that man. He knew that I knew how to cross out court with the ball and make decisions for everyone. Yeah. I knew how to read a scouting report. I knew how to break it down. I knew how to give information to my teammates when they didn't get it right. And so he knew it was in me, 
to share information. Um, and, and, and so he gave me an opportunity to be more than that. My first two years at Old Dominion, I didn't even recruit. I was an assistant. Yeah. The only guy I recruited was CJ Giles mm. because he had played for my fast break program prior to have a relationship. Right. I was trying to hit a home run. Mm-hmm. But I spent more time with <laughs> the first two years. Um, and so I got a chance to learn the other parts of college basketball, college athletics that people don't know about mm-hmm. or don't learn. So in answer to the question, I think it, more than a stigma, I just say yeah. that it's a minimized opportunity and guys don't get a chance to do more. Okay. When you've seen brothers going to jail over basketball, yeah. it tells you that they were put in a situation yeah. that, 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 that wasn't conducive to growth and becoming more than what it was that they were doing. Yeah. And, exactly. and a lot of it, you know, them guys probably really didn't do all the things that people say. Right. right. <laughs> but somebody's got to be the scapegoat. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 and the world says the black guy recruits. Yeah. You know? So it had to be that guy. Yeah. So, you know, some of it's opportunity. And, and, and I always tell guys when you get a chance, man, if, if I ever talk to anyone about coaching in college, you got to ask for more roles. You, okay. you can't take the job and just be the recruiter. And I get sometimes guys feel like it's my shot. Yeah. But you 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 go you're gonna be that hamster man on that wheel. So once you put yourself in that box, they're gonna keep you there. It's hard to get out of it. It's yeah. Kind of, perception is is what it is. Yeah. And, and and so when you look at like when they do the national rankings, like the best assistant coaches in this league and the best assistant coaches in that league, that's all who got players. Mm. Right. If, if if we work together, if we work in the same league, right? You guys, you're at Eastern Washington, you're at Weaver State, and I'm in the right. state of Montana. If they ask me who I think the best assistants are, how do I know? I'm not at practice. Yeah. I don't see you with the guys. I don't see you work them out. I don't see anything. But I know you got some good players. <laughs> Fred, man, he got all the guys. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and so guys have reputations for recruiting. And, you know, and, and, and so guys just need opportunities, man. And it's hard because ADs don't go out and watch practices. They don't, they're not watching the games. By the time they start hiring, the season's over. And, and, you know, I don't know how many ADs go back and watch film and watch the bench and, you know. I was an AD, I'd, I'd call a guy and tell me, send me some practice footage. Right, right. So I can see the real, huh? <laughs> But it, 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 it's tough, man. It, it's yeah. tough out there. I mean, you look at the enemy trying to get a head job. You know, Kansas City's doing things that never been done. Don't make no sense at yeah, all. It didn't. And and sometimes it's perception, right? And and you know, one rumor can kill your 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 career. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it and it doesn't have to be true. Yeah. You know, I don't know what the perception is of him. I'm not in the NFL business, but right. Something, there's, there's, there's something. Someone believed something that someone said or there's something, man. Yeah. Something. And, and the reality is he's getting the job done. And if, if, if I want to have a successful quarterback, I'm hiring that guy. Yeah. Oh, that's facts. So you guys played. Uh, you guys play. And, we, you know, we, we talk about, me and Fred talk about this. We've been talking about it all, all year, all season. Uh, you're a Seattle dude, so I think it is fair to ask. Uh, in a way, uh, you guys played UW this year. Uh, you guys won. Uh, I think the score was 66-58. And, you know, me and Fred have been talking about uh, necessarily how it's I, – I call it a – I call it a retooling year. I know a lot of people in Seattle is calling it a, a down year in UW. Uh, what, what did you see uh, playing those guys this year? Um, it, it's hard for me to speak on another team because, like I say, I'm, I'm not in that locker room. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when, when, when you have turnover, yeah. right, and, and Romar went through this. Yeah. And, and if you look at it, I mean, there's a lot of teams not doing what they normally do right yeah. now. Yeah. Some, of the, bit, some yeah. of the blue bloods, oh, we talk about that. Yeah. Everybody's and struggling. This is not a year to – have lost two two guys to the draft, two freshmen <laughs> to the draft, 
and try to replace them in April when you can't even go out and recruit. Yeah. And then have your guys be in an apartment or or at dorms the whole fall and then try to knock out a couple practices. Yeah. And then go play with no closed door scrimmages, no nothing. No, nothing. When you got a brand new roster, it's hard, man, because there's no chemistry. Yeah. I don't know what you can do. Mm-hmm. I've seen you on film. I've seen the stats. I remember when you were a high school player. But until I go to work with you, I don't know what you can do. So there's just so much unfamiliarity with the guys I'm putting on the floor. It's hard. I'm going through that. Yeah. Right. I, I've got a lot of new faces, and i got a lot of freshmen on the floor. Right. And and I think we're number one in the country for minutes played by freshmen. Yep. And and so it's a roller coaster ride. If you watch some guys play Oregon, you're like, hey man, they figured it out. Yeah. Like I, I told the staff and I told the team, I said, Hey, don't don't believe what you've seen in the stats yeah. from the games prior. We're gonna watch this Oregon game. Yeah. And right, and they they kind of tweak the rotation, whatever. And just, you know, I, I, I just, they're thin a little bit, and, and it is what it is. Yeah. I don't know that you call it a down year. I think I mm. call it a COVID year. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. You know, I, I just, you know, you saw them the other day. They played well the other night, right? The last couple last games, game. I will say, UCLA and versus Colorado, they played they play good. Right. And, and so it's musical chairs until you figure it out. And, and the reality is when you got so many young dudes, I mean, how many guys are out there that, have, that play real minutes? Yeah. And then you lose your best player. And and yeah. so it's just I, – I just think it's a, it's a COVID. Two, fir- two first-round picks, yeah, gone. And I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, speaking on you and your situation and when it comes to COVID. How has you and your team uh, been handling uh, this situation so far this year? It's been tough. Yeah. You know, we, we quarantined three times between July 1 – in September 22nd. Man. And and so we never got in shape. We never hit stride. And when we got back, it was time to start practice. And the biggest mistake I made is I made was we 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 got after it too soon. Yeah. And we should have phased in. We had a lot of injuries. Um, I've got two players right now that have that, that have practiced been to every practice. Damn. I probably only have three. Four that haven't missed at least two weeks of practice at some point. So we, we got freshman year returning. He missed eight weeks with a broken hand. Comes back for a week and a half and then gets a concussion and he's out again. Damn. So, Damn. But, but, but I think that's descriptive of college basketball right now. Like across the board, there's just those teams like Baylor – and Gonzaga, they look like they just never stopped practice. Man, come on. That's, <laughs> look at them. <laughs> I feel like no, when they shut down, look, they had positive cases and played the next day. Right? They were the tournament, had a positive, and they just played. Right. That was the crisis. <laughs> right? So, you know, they, 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 they're like, hey, man, we, we got something going right now. We, 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 we got a machine right now. We're not, we're not stopping the machine. And, and so they've been fortunate. You know, Baylor, I think they finally had to shut down. And, and then, you know, guys like I obviously had a while back. But there's just some teams that hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. The other thing, too, is the teams that return, the bulk of their starters, yeah. the, their nucleus, are rolling. Eastern yeah. Washington, they return four or five starters. Yeah, Shantae got those guys rolling. Seven of their top ten guys. Yeah. Southern Utah returns six of their top eight. Those teams, they don't they don't need that many practices unless they put in a new offense or a new defense. Kentucky and Duke got a whole new team out there. Yeah. So you know it, it, it it's 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 been a long ride, man. And and the the biggest thing though is off the court. You know these kids are out of character. Yeah. And mental depression is big. Yeah. And so. You, you got to ask them how they're doing four or five mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. They might not get the truth. And, and so you got to force the process on them, even if they don't show signs. You just got to assume that every one of these kids is going through depression because if you think about the life of a college athlete, really a college student, yeah. but as a college athlete, we lock these guys up, man. These guys are in prison right now. Yeah. They can't go out. They can't go to parties. They can't eat in restaurants. 
You know, they can't go meet new friends because you can't have these contacts. Yeah. You want to play, you got to stay in this bubble. Can the practice go yeah. home? And, and, and so when you have shutdowns and they don't have basketball for two weeks at a time, when they come out of that hole, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? When you're in the hole, <laughs> they come out of that hole, <laughs> they might not be themselves. And, and, it, and it takes a while to get them back. And, and so to me, we're, we're, we're playing with fire a little bit because of that. Is, 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 there's just a lot of young men and women right now that basketball might be everything to them. And so they're enjoying being out there. And it's probably what's best for them to have it. Yeah. The other part of their life is, is, is out of whack and they can't do anything about it. Yep. And it's good having a, a coach that cares about you, man. Oh, you know, we always talk about this. I feel like when you play for guys that, um, you know, you feel like, you know, care about you, you could talk to, you know, outside. It's bigger than basketball. They'll run through a brick wall for you. And I and I feel like I, I see why a lot of guys, uh, you know, chose to go to Montana and play for you because it's, you know, it's, I feel like nowadays guys are starting to understand it's about the relationship, you know. Well, and, and look at what's happening right now. I mean, look yeah. at Oklahoma State, mm. you know, they probably number one pick in the draft, number two pick in the draft. Normally would be somewhere else. Yeah. And guys are starting to spread out a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and making He's playing for his brother, correct? Uh, yep. I, don't, I, don't, I think that's his brother, it right? It might be a long-term relationship or something. Okay, I, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Okay. But I know that's not a destination for most of the Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. But but if you get to know Mike Winkin, you realize that if these kids give him an opportunity, you yeah. know getting those kids. So you know, you know him personally as a good dude? I know of him and I've heard him speak and I've been yeah. around him. Okay. I, I haven't just broke bread with him. Yeah. But I've been around him in settings that I can get a really good feel for who he is as a person and what he's about. Um, and that's the type of guy these kids want to play for, these young men. Exactly. Want to play for. So Leonard Hamilton's getting guys now. Like, yeah. it's starting to spread out. I still think he doesn't get enough credit at that. He doesn't. Shoot, man. Otis says doesn't. that all the time. He definitely says that. You start figuring out guys can coach a little better than they've been getting credit for. They just they just haven't had the same guys some of these other people have had. And, and and now those things are coming to fruition, right? You know, shot the smarts bouncing back. Mm -hmm. um, and, good job at Texas. Right. And and I think those are guys that take care of their guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I've heard them talk about their graduation rates and how they're taking care of guys off the court and, and, and those types of things. And that goes a long way, especially in the pandemic. And I think right now it's been highlighted more. And I think you're going to start seeing that in the future where more kids are going to start spreading because they found out what's real. Mm. Yeah, we talk, I talk to my guy, Coach Brooks, about that all the time. I think parents and players are starting to understand it's not about the gimmick. They're starting to realize it's about more of the, 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 the yuck, you know, not the fluff. You don't have to be in a blue blood to be successful. Right, man. I hear that a lot, man. <laughs> as much as I as much as I love Kentucky, I'm really starting to realize that you can go flourish wherever. Right. And you know, and, and it's different, it's different strokes for different folks, man. So, mm -hmm. you know, Kentucky's the right fit for certain guys. Yeah. Right. And, and, and some guys it's not. Like I, I, I recruited a guy that went there. Man, he's not a junkyard dog. Yeah. That's not his environment. Like, that's not. Yeah. Right and 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 so it's just different style of play. Yeah. Right. Some kids. I mean, I've seen that with Amal Roy at Oregon. He came to you and looked like a total. He looked like the guy we kind of seen in high school, like yep. back to that guy. Right. And 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 Amad was seeking relationship. Like yeah. he's a relationship basketball player. So right. If, if he's not vibing with the head coach, yeah, he's not himself. Yeah. Um. I, I think if he'd have gave it another year, he would have been fine. Yeah, and that's just my opinion. That's true. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, you know, I was, I played a major role in his recruitment. Yeah, because I signed him at Cal. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you no, know, and then the decisions he made after, I, I didn't play a role in that. But I mean, just I knew what he needed, and I knew it fit him. I, I their style of play was conducive to him being a good basketball player. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. You know, he just there was things he wanted 
and it wasn't being catered to or any of that. It was just things that as, as a person that he thrives with. He wasn't getting those and, and, and he, he wasn't very patient with the process, um, which most kids aren't. You know, yeah. but I, I do think if he would have stayed, he, he would have been on the floor on that final 14. One, qu- one question. So you got, what year did you get out? Did you get out in 2015, 16? Of uh, Cal? No, what, what year did you get him to uh, Montana? Uh, so I was at, I, my first year in Montana was 14, 15. 14, yep. I came that summer. Okay. 15. So do you feel like um, a guy like I met kind of uh, set the tone for you? As far as like other guys and you know kids coming in, do you feel like he it was an easy tone setter? In terms of like who I recruited after, right, right. You know, it's funny he came in with the guys. Okay. Um, we we you know I, I've got one other assistant, Chris Cobb, on my staff right now. Mm-hmm. He was on my staff then, right? Okay. And the, the guys I have now weren't. And and when we first came in. You know, recruiting was number one on the board for us. Yeah. We got to get guys. We, we can't, we don't have time to try to get this thing going over a period of time. Like, we have to win now. Yeah. I don't get time. Right. And, and so we, we, we got Michael Guine, uh, Ahmad Rory, Saeed Pridget. Mm-hmm in a nine-month stretch. Got some guys. So, Saeed Pritch is fourth all-time in scoring. Ahmad yep. Smith, Michael Guinea sixth. <laughs> Damn. Um, and, and so, Mike came in as a freshman and played one year while Ahmad redshirted mm-hmm. as he transferred. Yep. Saeed came in as a freshman the next year. So, the 16-17 season – we had a kid, uh, Walter Wright, that averaged 23 a game uh, in junior college at Snow College. Yep, Snow, Utah. So he, he was a senior. Ahmad was a sophomore. Michael Guinea was a sophomore who had broke his hand, so he missed the first six games. Saeed Pridgett was a freshman. Um, and, and so we had that group rock for three years. Yeah. So we, we, we hit some home runs early. But like I said, those were all guys that had chips. Ahmad was trying to prove something. Yeah, Michael he always was a dog to me, man. That's why I liked him. He was a dog, man. Hungry. Right, right. So we 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 hit some home runs, and then we had all the right pieces, man. Bobby Moorhead, you know, tougher than people think, and you know, could guard one through five, make shots, um, get all the loose balls, and know every, every all the plays from every position. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's you know, extremely critical at that level. Yeah, definitely. We, we were fortunate, man, that, you know, the Northwest and, and California was good to us. I'm, I'm going to say this, man, before we get out, uh, this is most definitely one of the realest narratives we've had in yeah. our early uh, career in Hoop, uh, Hoop Narrative Podcast. Uh, I think when this comes out, man, uh, you, you're giving a lot of real for free and <laughs> definitely appreciate uh, having you on, um, dang, I, I would definitely wish we would have extended the invite much sooner. You have Paul Crawford on here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't get no realer than that, man. Nah, you, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> hey, Chav, I got one question before we get you up out of here, man. If you could name three or four dudes that was bad when you was in high school in the Washington area, man, three or four dudes that was that you feel was either underappreciated or just – one of the baddest dudes, you know, baddest guys you've seen. Um, the legend was Chris Fogerson. Mm, I heard High a lot about that. I heard a lot about Chris. I think it's class of 85. Now, they had a loaded team. Uh, Craig Jordan playing in the middle. Craig Jordan threw the, threw the fastball. He probably could have been a major, major league pitcher mm. at like 6'10 or 6'9 or something like that. <laughs> Um, but they they had guys, right? They 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 had Bill Ellaby coming off the bench to like think his junior year. Um, but Chris Chris was the guy that everybody looked up to. Yeah, he was the athlete. He dunked on everybody. He scored it. He was tough. We saw him every day. You know, um, he 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 rep he repped us. He repped us. Yeah. Um, 
the other guy to me, yeah, Derek Fields. D Fields, man. Nine, and, and Derek and I grew up playing Rainier Beach together. Um, Derek was the leading scorer for Rainier Beach, that team with Doug Christie, mm-hmm. Adam Sadlick, um, and those guys. And 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 that that team was special, man, because that Rainier Beach team, so D Fields at six foot. You know, athletic, dunk on you, right. he did. He was a bucket. Probably was a first team all state guy in football, basketball, and baseball. Yeah. He played full seasons in football and baseball, but he always was hooping. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and so by far the most underrated guy, if you want to talk about somebody coming out of Seattle, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But on that team was a guy by the name of Tyrone Pollard, hmm. who was a prolific scorer. Never, I don't know if I ever seen him pass. So we all <laughs> we all played for, for for Metcalf from third grade to seventh grade. Okay. And then in seventh grade, my dad spun off. So we went from having two teams, Metcalf Alcatara, to having Metcalf Alcatara and DeCure. Okay. And so uh myself. And my best friend, D'Amico Dotson, we went with my dad, and they left the rest of the team intact. Okay. And then he went and found some different players. And Tyrone and, 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 and Derek and all them guys stayed on that team. And Tyrone was a bucket, right? And a guy by the name of Mario Bailey, who played for Washington. Who Mario he Bailey. He mm-hmm. was Heisman pose. Yeah. Got the touchdown, Desmond Howard didn't get in the end zone, right? We had talent. Um but Tyrone Pollard went to Bakersfield and won two national championships. Mm. A lot of people don't talk about that. Wow. And then class of 90 on that team was his brother Trent, who went to Eastern Washington and played for the Cincinnati Bengals. Mm. Power forward on that team was a guy by the name of Ray Hall. He's a Metcalf. Okay. okay. He's the nephew of the Metcalf, of Tim Metcalf, the coach. He played for the Jacksonville Jaguars after going to Washington State. So there were pros. <laughs> yeah, I was about to yeah, say, it's real yeah, professional. Names, you know. I, hey, I'll be honest with you, man. I'm telling the honest God truth. Yeah. My dad was like, man, we got to go ahead and just go over here, man. We got to we gotta play our own team. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm playing small forward. I'm like third string. I can't get no tick. Yeah. And so he created a team. And then we, and then seventh grade, we lost to them in the, in the playoffs. And then eighth grade, we won the championship. Okay. Um. But D Fields was 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 the guy. Mario Bailey growing up was the guy that was the most dominant of everyone. Okay. And then by the time we got to high school, D Fields took over from that point. But 89 was loaded. Uh on my team, we had a guy by the name of Steve Taylor. Steve Taylor signed to go to Fresno and then some stuff happened and he came home or whatever. But he was first team all metro at Franklin like three years. Mm, okay, that's my alma mater, so I got to do my homework, man. I had a guy by the name of Jamal Miller. Jamal was the starting point guard at Garfield for two years. We yeah. played him for district championship. So that Rainier Beach group, yeah, right, that class of 89 with one from 90. Doug Christie used to bounce in and out with us because he was our age. Yeah. Class of 88 was loaded. And then and then you had the, 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 the guys that were out in the CD. Yeah. And the Catholic school group, DeMario Hall <laughs> was the first one to dunk in our age group. D. Like Hall. <laughs> Shout out Big D. Hall. He was dunking in the eighth grade. Um, <laughs> but then you got guys like Demetrius DeBose, Jason Thomas, mm, Jeff Jordan, Jay all them guys that went to O'Day. Yeah. We're at St. Edwards. Um, we're playing for other teams too. So, okay. and then High Point, who they won the championship in seventh grade, kind of came out of nowhere on us. That was the West Seattle group. Yeah. They had four D1 or five D oneers. Marcus Lawley actually lived up by me in Skyway. Mm. And he went to Stanford. So that 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 era, that class yeah. 89, mm-hmm. there probably were 20 to 25 D1 athletes. Damn. And probably 15. Play D1 basketball. Yeah. And then six or seven play D1 football. Washington State, Notre Dame, Washington, Idaho, places like that. So it, it, it was 
a deep group. Yeah, you can, you can. Because it wasn't, we didn't have an AAU team. We, we, and Pepple had the BCI and, you know, it was mostly East High kids from, from his, his group, the Redmond right. and the Mercer yeah. Islands and all those kids. And then he'd pluck a guy, you know, Bill Ellaby was fortunate to play for him. Uh, Chris Ferguson was, Ferguson was fortunate to play for him. I think Doug might have played one year. Christy might have played one year. Uh, Tim Goodman out of, out of, out of West yeah. out, of, out of itself. Yeah. One of the high point guys, I think, played. Yeah. I know Tim. The rest played with my dad. And, man, we'd be lucky if we go to one tournament. Mm. We had to wash some cars, man, to make it happen. <laughs> OT uh, was loaded, so OT. Yeah, man. The There's a lot of dudes that just never left the South End, never left the CD, that were better than all the guys that got out. Yeah, that's real. You, 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 a lot of old heads going to listen to this, and, you know, you're going to take them back with all the knowledge that you just gave us, man. <laughs> and I, I, you know. Rex we, and, we love it too, man. We love it, man. Okay. Huh? I said we love it too, man. Just the history, the you know, the knowledge, uh, you know, where you started, where you're at, you know, what you stand for, like, you know, and that's one of the things that matter for us is the guys our age, and we got guys a little younger than us that listen. They need to know this history. They need to know the guys that that are doing it, but also doing it the right way. So yeah, you know. Um, I will say this though, if it weren't for guys like Doug Christie and yeah. Jamal Crawford, yeah. the, the guys that are that are out there now, yeah. Doug Ren, you know, if it weren't for those three, I, I think there'd still be guys slipping through the cracks. I, I yeah. you know, and, and some people made those things happen. You know, yeah. Dan Finkley, Daryl Hennings. Shout out Dan D80. Yeah, you know, th those those guys, they put they put some time in. To yeah. get guys out, mm -hmm. right? And and Doug did it. You know, he he went the hard route, man. He went to Pepperdine and sat a year and then played three, and you know. Yeah. But if if those guys don't go do something extra special, I think there's a lot of the dudes, man, from from the '90s, from the from the from the later '90s, early 2000s to now. Yeah. You know that, that that might not be getting what they're getting. If, if Rotary didn't become a household name, yeah. You know, I, there, there's some guys. I, you know, they're talented. They're good enough to be where they're where they're at and where they went. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what happens, man. I, I, you know, Jason Terry, you know, add into that group, like, yeah. Those guys made some things happen. Yeah. No, oh, definitely, man. Uh, shout out to Coach Trav, uh, Montana Grizzly uh, head coach, coming in again. Uh, you can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube, Anchor. Uh, I know I'm missing some. We, nah, all, we always, always do this. <laughs> hey, Hoop Narrative on all streaming platforms. <laughs> <laughs> hey, make sure you guys uh, check out Coach Trav to the University of Montana, man. You, uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, hearing people talk and getting a feel for yourself. So I'm sure you, this is a guy you guys are going to have no problem turning the TV on and watching his group. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. On behalf of man, my bro, Fred Joe, once again, uh, Coach Trav DeCure and myself, man, Hoop Narrative, man, we out. We out. Took a breather and came back in no time. Yeah, put the ball in my possession in the showtime. I'm taking the last shot, coach. Don't mind. I'm a different predicament, so it troubles you. Game clock ticking and I'm coming for the W. One man ain't enough, they gon' have to double two. Get ball shot made, all the fans loving you. Time expired, everybody rushing. Now you just showed them what you about. Try to tell you we was gon' make it without a doubt. Do what they can, I'm already stamped And I be shitting like Kevin Durant Kevin Durant, in the game, made up When I steps on the floor, I don't waste time Two seconds, one shot, I'ma make mine Make a three-pointer on baseline They want my spot, I'm trying to save mine So you should move over 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 So you should move over